The Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary forms a unique historical link between the Civil War and now. It has a rich history, and we'll share some of that with you in this video, but we'd need a few hours to even get close to telling its full story. So today, we will focus more on the facility and imagine what everyday life might have been like for those who were sentenced to serve time here. Welcome to Brushy Mountain. In this tour, we're going to focus on four main areas. One, the main building which housed the entrance, the cafeteria, and general population cell blocks A, B, and C. Two, the museum which housed laundry facilities and the infamous hole. Three, the yard, and finally, four, cell block D, which acted as lockdown. We started our tour by simply walking in the front doors the same way that prisoners did for decades. All right, guys, well, behind me, you can see the light of the front door as you enter into the prison here. And one of the first areas that you're gonna come into is this trap gate area where you're gonna come into a, a place that you're gonna hear those doors slam behind you for the first time. You can see behind me, there's another set of gates. You're now into an area where you've got gates all around you. And uh, the feeling that you are truly trapped, mm. That's a very real thing. Well, once you come out into the courtyard, get outside the prison uh, building itself, you enter into a courtyard here where you can get to the, to the uh, gymnasium and stuff. You come across one of these more brutal aspects this is not something that they've added after the fact. This is the whipping post. And you guys may have heard about this. The whipping post is just one of the brutal torments that they gave to the people that were here who uh, were not doing what they were wanting them to do. The townsfolk that lived around here reportedly said that they could hear screams coming from the prison from the, the torture that was being implemented on the people here. It's probably part of why some people even today when they come on these grounds say that they can feel the bad juju. People have endured a lot inside these walls including the open areas like the courtyard here. As you approach the facility looking to the right you'll see a sidewalk leading to an entrance. Through that entrance you'll see a building. That building is the current house of the museum but it's the original location for the laundry and the hole. This building used to be the laundry. You can still see some of the equipment that's here. This is uh, where they did the dirty work, you might say. But prisoners would handle the laundry for all of the others here within this facility. A lot of people, as they tour this facility, they look at the deplorable conditions and they think, oh my gosh, how people actually lived in this. This would have been horrible. But you got to keep in mind, this would be, these uh buildings have been sitting empty at this point for 15 years. People that we talk to here tell us that this place was immaculate. Uh, and you could eat off of the floor if you wanted to. I don't know if you want to, but you could. They kept it clean. What you're seeing here is not the actual living conditions. This is just the way that it's been after 15 years of not being maintained. Now let's take a look at this place that they refer to as the hole. This is where you went when you were on the naughty list. Down in here is where you would go. Now there's no ventilation down here, guys. There's no air conditioning, there's no heat, there's no ventilation. So when you come down in here, 
This is uncomfortable, especially you can imagine heat, cold, whatever. This is what you're going to be. You're going to be dealing with whatever it is um, just in its rawest elements. All right, guys, well, we're doing hard time. We're in the hole now. We've got some light that you can see on our faces, but that's just because there's a light that's out in the hall. This was not here before. This, you hear the echo? These are just concrete walls, very small cells. I would say this is probably 10 foot by five foot. And uh, this one happens to have a rack for two, but a lot of these didn't even have that. This one, these are tight, tight quarters, guys. And being down in here, this is where they put you. This was essentially isolation. Not the best of conditions, right? Now, guys, it would get so dark in the hole. The prisoners would typically lose their sight within a few days. That's That's got to be torment in and of itself. It was enough that once they were released from the hole, they would have to be assigned to another prisoner who would basically lead them around until they could regain their eyesight. Well, a lot of people have this idea that Brushy was like the perfect prison, prison that it was inescapable, but that's not actually true. Um, a lot of people actually escaped from this facility. And one of the reasons is because they didn't have a lot of fences and gates on the back side of this facility. They relied on the terrain, the mountains that kind of surround, kind of make a C shape around this prison to help cut down on the number of people that were getting out. But you can go back through the decades and see hundreds of stories of people that did actually escape from the prison. But if you did and you were able to get past the walls, look at what you had to in endure i mean this is just some of this you can see there the walls and what that would have been like to try to scale and get out i mean i don't know about you but i don't know that i could actually get uh, myself up over that So when you come out of the gymnasium, you move into this back part of the, of the facility, and this is what they referred to as the yard. This is where they would um, be able to get out here and stretch their legs a little bit. Um, you need to get these guys out in the sunshine. I'd seen that they uh, actually had a softball team and they would play against uh, teams that were willing to come into the prison and play against them. It looks like uh, today they've actually built a stage back here. That's not part of the original structure, obviously. But take a look at this wall here. The stone and the steep hills around are enough that people, even if they could get outside the fences, couldn't get past this a lot of times. Uh, there's a lot of stories about guys that got out. Then they couldn't get past nature. They just come back and turn themselves in because, I don't know, I mean, that's... That's not an easy climb right there, you know what I mean? And of course, you can see there in the back, there are guard towers all along this wall. So you can see that one. Let me turn around here. There's another one right there. They didn't make it easy on guys that wanted to get out of here. Now, evidently guys did get out of here. Like I said, hundreds of reports of people being able to get out. And they did make it out. A lot of the local folks, um, we're so accustomed to this happening that they would just start leaving clothes on the front porch or out front, um, sometimes even with food, in hopes that if somebody did get out, they'd just take the clothes, they'd just take the food and move on. There are stories of people that got out of here and did horrible things to the locals uh, so that they could get what they needed to take their next step towards freedom. It's just the reality of living this close to a place like this. All right, guys. Well, now we get our first look at some of these cells and see these devices up here where they can lock and unlock all of them at the same time. And then each of these had their own individual locks as well. Now, solitary confinement was a very real part of life here at Brushy. 
for those that did not behave, they had to put them somewhere. So they had 32 cells in the D block. D block was uh, gonna be for the guys that just simply were not behaving, but hadn't quite reached the hole. Well, the D block was interesting in that it had shared exercise facilities. These are slots that you can kind of see off behind me here. These are um, <laughs> rooms that I would say are probably about 30 feet deep and about 12 feet wide. They'd allow multiple prisoners, small groups, one or two or three in at a time. And uh, that was so that they could get some exercise even though they were still in solitary. But even this wasn't safe. There are stories about uh, one individual at least who was working out with one of his fellow cellmates. He was lifting weights, a guy was spotting for him. And as he was uh, doing his exercises, the guy spotting held the bar down on the guy's chest so another inmate could shank him. This was not a safe place to be. This place was known for its violent criminals and um, I had a very high population of first degree murders who were just as violent inside as they had been outside. Now, B block is a lot more like what you would think you'd see in a prison. A lot of standard cells, which essentially have two racks, a toilet and a small desk, a small space that's probably 12 by 12. I'm counting 20 cells here with a shower right down there at the end, but four stories of that. I mean, 80 cells just in this one section alone. Now, these upper areas had these cages on them, but that was not the original design. Originally, they were just railings. Of course, boys will be boys, I guess, and others were thrown off of those, leading to these cages being installed. Now, when you visit these upper level cell blocks, um, now you can get a good look at this cage that's uh, been put in place to keep people from being thrown over. In one particular incident, a guy was thrown over after being stabbed in the neck. I guess they really wanted to send a message here. But he was thrown over and landed on two guards. It seems that the message was not only for the prisoners not to mess with this particular gang, but also to the guards who were working here. Well, for these more standard cells, you can see the experience was not pleasant, but then again, come on, this is a prison. It's not designed to be pleasant, right? But even little things could make a big difference for these guys. Right now, there's an open door right there. The person that was in this cell, if that door was open, that would be a, a good day for them, right? And right across, you can even see where there's windows that can be open. Now, were they open? I think that on day, days where doors and windows were open like this, even for the guys that were inside their cells, that would make a dramatic impact on the quality of that particular day. And there's a lot of things that you can really experience here, but you can't get to every part of this place. A lot of it is open. They want you to be able to get a good idea as far as what this, uh, this facility was like, but it's not all open, even behind me here. This is stairs to the upper decks, and you can, at least at the time that we're here, you can get to the first and second deck cells like this, but the third and fourth ones are closed off. You don't need to go up there to really kind of understand what you're dealing with. They're primarily very, very similar, if not exactly the same. Well, guys, if you've not followed up on the history for this place, it's worth looking into. I think that um, some of the stories behind it are just fascinating to me. Um, stories of riots, stories of breakouts. Um, but some of the interesting ones to me are the stories where the prisoners would take over, and often they wanted nothing more than to talk with the warden. But when they would do this, then you would find weapons coming out of nowhere. There was a story about uh, a guy that was able to overcome one of the guards when he was being unshackled. 
But then another guy joined in and this guy had a gun. Oh my goodness, where did he get a gun? And uh, while they were trying to get that situation under control, four other prisoners managed to saw through their bars and get out. And now they had to, you know, essentially form a tactical team to come in and get that resolved. They were able to do so, but this was not all that uncommon. Things like this did happen. Interestingly enough, it wasn't a gun that he had. It was a bar of soap covered in shoe polish. <laughs> Pretty clever. Now this is one of the areas that I thought was one of the most interesting places in the entire facility. This is the cafeteria. And when you come in here, one of the things that you're gonna notice is all of these images on the walls. Some of these are really, really good. These images were painted by prisoners um, who were, at least in some part, in good standing with the warden. He would allow them to come in here after dinner and work on these. There's a remarkable number of animals when you come through here and look at these. There's cats and birds and raccoons and you name it, fish. I mean, they're all over the place in here. It turns out that even though a lot of these men were violent murderers who seemed to have very little interest in human life, they were very big animal lovers. Go figure. Now this idea to allow inmates to, uh, you know, do this and put up the paintings that you see in here, that's an interesting decision made by the warden, but one that ultimately seemed to be a very positive thing. I mean, this was a therapeutic of, in some ways for some of these guys. And I think overall, I think whether they admit it or not, I bet there were some that really appreciated looking at these pictures rather than just the blank walls that were there before. Now the warden got to pick who was gonna do this. And so I would imagine that they, the guys that were interested in doing this would probably try to keep their noses clean so that they could continue their work in here. Now leaving the cafeteria, you enter into these breezeways where the stairs are at and there are cell blocks off to the sides here. If you take a right, you can enter into the family visitation area or the, the visitor center here where you were allowed to meet with your guests who would come to see you in prison. Back over here on this side is where the uh, families or friends would get cleared by the guards before being allowed to come in. And then they'd be able to enter into this space here. Now, in some instances like this, you've got this, uh, type of a cell where you have to be behind bars and you can speak to your guests across the glass. But then in other areas like this room, you were able to actually come in and, and spend time with your family members as a group. A lot of different ways that you can uh, give a cellmate incentive to mind their P's and Q's. Well, one of the questions that they get a lot here is which cell was James Earl Ray in? James Earl Ray, the guy that was accused of killing Martin Luther King Jr. He uh, was not in any one given cell. He actually bounced around. I believe they said possibly as many as 35 different cells during his time while he was here. They can't really nail down any one particular cell. Now they had to move him around for his own safety. Obviously, there were gonna be people here that were upset about what had happened. Um, and while he, while he uh, initially had um, admitted to that crime, he later recount, recanted that saying that he was pressured by the FBI and others. I'll leave that to you to decide what you think about that. But, um, James Earl Ray eventually did die in prison, but it wasn't here. As you walk the halls here, you can really begin to get a feel for what life would have been like. Uh, day started early, as early as 4.30 a.m. Breakfast was served at six. Lights out in the evening at 9 p.m. Everybody here was required to work or go to school. Some were here earning their GEDs. Others 
were actually doing jobs like working in the laundry for which they got paid typically minimum wage um, but they would work all day until around three or four o'clock at which time they would be uh, they'd be put back into their cells for head count afterwards you've got dinner you've got a little time for recreation maybe some basketball or something not a lot of time because back in bed by nine and the day begins early again for much longer but again guys this is prison it wasn't intended to be a vacation it was intended to be a punishment for wrong choices that were made and i would have to say that while some eventually became accustomed to this it probably did very much feel like they were being punished now i know at this point a lot of people are going to be saying all right where are the ghosts i want to see the video of the demons that live within this place we haven't seen them guys <laughs> we haven't seen them but you know the stories about this abound including you know ben over at semper gumby you guys know ben over at semper gumby if you haven't checked him out scoot over and check him out he's our neighbor here at uh the expo at the camping event this is, we're here for the southeast overland camping events he's our next door neighbor well ben came up here last night to kind of check a few things out and was up here alone and heard one of the cell doors slam shut and that was enough for him he was gone and stories like that they abound uh, there's tons of them people who uh claim to have sensitivities to spiritual matters they say they feel a certain sense of gloom or whatever when they enter this place. It's true, guys, that a lot of really, really bad things have happened in this facility. It's a prison. It was packed with some of the worst people in the country. And a lot of bad things happened to those people while they were here. So is there bad juju in this place? There's bad history. And um, has that carried over? Some would say absolutely yes. Unfortunately for you guys, we don't have any footage of demons running loose in the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. Did you hear that, guys? It sounds like the prisoners banging on the bars with their cup. Hmm. I don't like that I got it on video. Wow, check out this old Ford. Look at this. The Warden. Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. This is a ride now. Holy cow, look at that thing. Now, if you're planning to visit, there are other things on site to see. They have their own distillery, which is called the End of the Line. They have a distillery store and an on-site restaurant called the Warden's Table. Tours of the facility are available but are limited, so be sure to do your homework before coming out. Please let us know in the comments what you thought about this video, and if you've not already done so, please subscribe to our channel.